Hey, this is Pastor Dad. Um, recently, I released the word for advancement, for worship, and for reward. And how I believe God has called us into a time of war right now as we transition through the harvest, through the summer, leading into September. So I want to break down what worship is. But first, let's look at what war is. According to Wikipedia, the definition of war is a state of armed conflict between groups. It is generally characterized by extreme aggression, destruction, and mortality using regular or irregular military forces. Now, that's a lot. We all talk about war and what it means. But I want to look at war in the context of we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Excuse me. And since today we're going to be talking about worship first, I want to actually read a worship psalm of David. The king who led Israel just into victory and then his son led Israel into the golden age. So let's look at how he who's known as the worshiper before God. Let us see and hear his prayer of worship. He has a lot of them, and they're all really good. But I want to look at Psalm 63. So I'm going to read this out for us as a prayer. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land, where no water is, to see your power and your glory. So I have seen you in the sanctuary. <laughs> that is so beautiful. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Hallelujah, Lord. When I remember you upon my bed and I meditate you in the night watches because you've been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings will I rejoice. My soul follows hard after you. Your right hand upholds me. Oh, but those seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. So let us pray. God, I thank you for worship. For the focus of our hearts and our minds, our emotions and our will upon something. You are the something that I desire to worship. You are the one thing that I want to praise. Above all else, everything directs back to you and your glory. So Lord, right now I ask that you would just be with us during this time together. Guide it for ministry on all sides. For help on all sides. For comfort and kindness on all sides. We praise you and bless you. Lord, just be with my family. As I'm here doing this, God, to send your comfort. Help them to understand and to see that lives are being changed. Change my life as I do this. Change the lives of those who watch this. Be with us in all that we do. In your holy, awesome name, Jesus. Amen. So... War is a state of armed conflict. Armed. Weapons. 
So what are our weapons? They're not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And flip over to Ephesians 5. Now this is going to be a bit more of a teaching today. I want to really break down what worship is. Um, so bear with me as we break this down. I really do believe that if you'll take the time to listen and learn, that your life of worship will change and increase in a great way. Um, that we may prove what is acceptable under the Lord. For we were once darkness, now we're light, walk as children of light. And that's Ephesians 5, verses 10 and 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather seek to change them. So then in Ephesians 6, we go into verse 10. Finally, my brothers, are you there? You got it open? Good thing you can just push pause. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes of the devil, the enemy of Satan. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That right there is a breakdown. Um, many of us know the game chess. It's one of the most famous strategy games of all time. And in chess, you have your king and your queen. Your king is your most important piece. Your queen is your most powerful piece. I would say that's a pretty good representation of how God created the earth. My wife is amazingly powerful and talented. And without me, we can't have children. So it takes two. So chess is the same way. In chess, you have your king and your queen. And then you have your leadership. And then you have your pawns. Right here, we get the definition, the description of that not just do we have Satan... The enemy and his schemes. But he has all of his employees. All of his generals. His lieutenants. His captains. And they all have one objective. To destroy anything that is good. He has three ways of trying to do that. To steal. To kill. And to destroy. What does it say in Wikipedia? Aggression. Destruction. And mortality. Mortality is death. Destruction is destruction, and aggression, stealing land from somebody else. Feeling that your, your feelings are hurt, so you're trying to take back what was taken from you. And your hurt feelings. Okay, do you hear me? This is a picture of what we live in. We do not live in a place without conflict. But if we will focus our war in worship... We will advance and we will receive a reward. So worship. I define worship as focusing of the mind, the heart, and the will. It is the intention of energy paid in respect or sacrifice. Every act that we take is an act of worship. When you have a kind word with your wife, or when you have an angry word with your wife, you are showing her either worship, or you are showing the enemy worship. You're showing worship for who God created, or you're showing worship for the aggression of the enemy. Every choice we make is a choice of what we will worship. You know, Abraham was the one that God promised to be the founder of faith. To be the, the, the birth man of a nation that would love God and serve God. A chosen people, a chosen generation. Now that doesn't mean that nothing can ha bad can happen to them. 
just means that there's a different amount of energy given to them. I love Israel. And one day I will set foot in Israel. And I will witness these people. And I'll experience their culture. I've done it in Guatemala. And I've done it in London. In England. And anywhere that I go, I am overwhelmed with the excitement of who God is for these people. How much greater in a place where there's a lot of history. But none of that would have happened if Abraham hadn't been obedient. The Lord told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Abraham said to his two servants, My son and I will go up and worship. Then we will return to meet you here. What was this man thinking? God had told him to sacrifice his son. But instead of worshiping his son in trying to find a way to keep his son alive, he chose to worship the one who gave him the son in the first place. Knowing any number of things can happen. It is possible that I kill my son, but God gives me another son. It's possible that if I kill my son, the Lord raises him from the dead. It's possible that my God is testing me to see if my heart is for him or for my son. Where is my heart aligned with? The promise or the promise giver? And the story goes on to say that history was written of a ram being found in the thicket and an angel telling Abraham, you passed the test, great job, now you are the father of many nations. You can't be the father of many nations if you're all concerned about the one little thing that God has given you. Because you've got to be more concerned with what God is doing in the earth. And right now we're in that time and place where what God is doing in the earth is calling out the leader in you. It's calling you to be a leader. It's not just about worshiping with songs of adoration, with thanksgiving going into his gates with praise going into his courts. But there's a lifestyle of worship that becomes an intimate relationship between the promise of God, God himself, and the dynamic relationship that will follow. So let's go over to Joshua. And we're going to look at the story of Jericho the first battle of Joshua. Now Joshua was the son of Nun. He was a young man led out of Egypt with Moses in the wilderness. He went out on God's word, spied the land of Cana. And he had faith that God would win the battle if they fought. To receive the great grapes. The great fruit. The great cities. And yet the men with him. Were afraid. And they said. We are the size of grasshoppers. In their sight. And because of that. Joshua and his friend Caleb. Spent 40 years. Holding on to that promise. Of victory. Along with that, there were all these children that were born either in the wilderness or in Egypt, but were not of age. And as they were not of age, they did not pass away with the doubting generation. But they were a generation that knew the full provision of God. Manna that came from the sky. Quail, because they got sick of just having bread. Or the what is it of God. And then there was the water in the desert. There was the cloud by day so that they didn't get sunburned. There was the fire by night so they were warm and knew where they were going. This is a place of experiencing and encountering God at every turn. Personally, I have a life of not being with God my entire life. But since I came into the kingdom and accepted the kingdom, 
I have heard all the stories of the Jesus movement. Not all of them, but most of them. Of the Jesus movement. Of the Brownsville revival. Of the Azusa Street revival. Of the ministries of John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth. There is a culture that exists on the earth right now that knows and has experienced the healing power of God. The supernatural reality of things like gems falling from the sky, feathers and gold dust and laughter and all these different movements. If you don't believe that that stuff is real, I pray right now that you would see a desire in your heart to understand and not to hate. And that you would take a moment to do some research on these events. Look at the Toronto Revival. Look at the Brownsville Revival. Understand where it comes from. What it was that God wanted to do in the earth at that time. Because you're alive right now because of those men. Because of those people that laid their lives down. Billy Graham. Before most of us were born had a desire to live for you and I. He made decisions to, for you and I that have affected us to this day. I don't know of a single person in America. Most people in the world have heard of Billy Graham. And whether you appreciate him as a pastor or not, you will respect him as a man who went before kings. Now he has passed away and that is available for us today. Just like Joshua was the one to come up after Moses went away with the Lord. The Lord came to Joshua and said, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. As the Lord has been with Billy Graham, he can be with us. If we will partner with him and take the instruction to be of good courage. So now they find themselves, they've just crossed over the river Jordan on dry ground. The enemy of Cana is terrified, terrified of these men who they know from their stories of their parents of what God did for them in the wilderness. They could see it. They could see this army marching around the wilderness for 40 years. They saw the fire. They saw the cloud. They were afraid. And yet they were protected because of the fear of the Israelites. But now that fear is gone. Every one of those men of war have passed away. Moses has passed away. And Joshua on dry ground says, hey everybody. Verse 5, chapter 5. Verse 1. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the side of the Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over. Their hearts melted. There was no spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So now all of a sudden, the Israelites are on the other side. They're looking at this city filled with warriors who are scared of them. Now, in our own strength, it's awesome. Let's go take the castle. Let's do it. Let's do it. They're scared. They're running around. But remember, these people grew up under the provision of God at every turn. They were dependent. Do you hear what I'm saying? They were dependent upon God. Worship. One of the main aspects of worship is recognizing your dependency upon God. So in that dependency, they listened to the word of instruction from Joshua. Now, verses 2 through 9 is explaining the circumcision process. Of what I had just explained about the men of war had died in the wilderness and now these people had never known anything other than dependency on God. And so the second circumcision came. They were circumcised 
initially as men of war when they left Egypt. Now these people that did not get circumcised in the wilderness are instructed to be circumcised. Now, circumcision is the cutting away of the flesh. That's a physical representation of what the Lord wants to do in our hearts. He wants our hearts to be cut away from Egypt mentality. A thinking of slavery. A thinking of poverty. A thinking of lack. So he cuts all of that away. And the natural by the cutting of the flesh. Now we have no longer have a circumcision of the flesh, but of the soul. Our soul must be separated by the word of God to discern what is good and appropriate and wise. So we go through that process when we become born again. When we become followers and disciples of our Lord and Savior. So instead of going and taking the land, they all lay on the ground in pain, being healed by the hand of the Lord. It is a painful process when you live homeless, and you live in your van. It is a painful process when the people that you're closest to shut the door on you. Whether it's of your own choice, whether it's just the hand of God, whatever way it is, it is all the process of being pulled back, being cut away, being revealed to not need dependency on man, but to need dependency on God. Then you can have true communion and connection with your fellow men. So for the last time, they had manna. And then, in verse 11, they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morning after the Passover, the unleavened cakes and parched corn in the same day. And the manna, the what is it of God, the food of provision from heaven, ceased. Neither the children of Israel had manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Cana in that year. We go through a season of walking with the Lord where we don't understand our provision. But if we ask the question, what is this situation, God? We realize that it is hidden manna. The Bible says to the one who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna. That is the provision in the midst of any situation. And we are called to grow and mature and to eat of the fruit of the land. To become self-sustaining. Now it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. So now they've healed from the circumcision and Joshua is looking out across at this fortified, amazing city. And he sees a man standing there. Now, being Joshua, without fear, I'm being strong and of good courage as he was commanded, he went straight up to him and he said, Are you on our side or are you on their side? Are you for us or for our adversaries? <laughs> I can just see the look on this character's face looking at Joshua and going, <laughs> Neither. I am the captain of the hosts of the Lord, and now I'm come. That's all he had to say, and Joshua immediately knelt down in worship. Do we take that moment when we recognize the presence of God? When we recognize that the situation we're in is a blessing of God. Not really favoritism of any kind, but designed to help us. Do we stop what we're doing and bow down before Him? Bow down before a holy God who created the heavens and the earth with the intent of having a relationship with you.
So then Joshua said, What, Lord, do you say to me, your servant? My Lord, what do you say to your servant? See, at that point, he wasn't the leader of the Israelites. At that point, he wasn't the most mature warrior individual of his people. He was a son of none. I think it's interesting the guy's name was none. N-U-N. When you are a son of none, you recognize the need for a father. Joshua followed Moses, but Moses was not his father. I'm curious to know when Joshua's father, Nun, passed away. Did he pass away when Joshua was but a youth? Before he ever saw the promised land and spied it out? Whatever the case may be, it doesn't tell us. But it does say that he was the son of Nun. There are often times in my life where I feel like I belonged to nobody. Where I was not just the red-headed stepchild, but I was the beaten dog that couldn't even beg for scraps. King David, who we read his psalm, he wasn't even there asked by his parents when the prophet Samuel came into town. They finally were like, oh yeah, David's out in the field with the sheep. We should go get him. He comes in and finds out he's going to be the king of Israel? There are so many times in our lives where we're at our brokenness, we're at our least valued position. But that's because we're only looking with natural eyes. God sees more in none. So he acknowledges himself before the Lord. Doesn't pay attention to the people around him at that moment. It doesn't matter. What matters is what is God saying in this situation. And the captain of the Lord said, Loose the shoes from off your feet. For where you stand is holy ground. So Joshua took off his shoes. The reason we take off our shoes in the presence of God isn't a physical, just, oh, it's cuss. It's because there are so many receptors in the feet. Our shoes protect our feet from dirt and grime. There are so many pores in your feet. If you've ever done a foot bath or you've detoxed, you may have put something on your feet for detoxification. And there's a lot of stuff that's pulled out of the body because there's so many pores in our feet. Now, the Lord says, take off your shoes because it's holy ground. Imagine, like a tree, stepping on the holy ground and feeling the holiness rise up through the pores of your feet. You become sensitive to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You're able to feel the boundaries of what God is saying and doing. Now Jericho was a tight city, shut up because of the fear of the children of Israel. No one went in, no one came out. So now the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given, your hand, Jer I've given into your hands Jericho, the king and the mighty men of valor. So the Lord gives him the strategy. For six days you'll walk around the city. No one will say a word. There will be no sound. The seven priests will carry the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant was this giant beautiful box that had the tablet of stone where the Lord wrote the Ten Commandments down for Moses. I find it very interesting that technology of this day is tablets. Tablets and lap pads and smartphones and all that. Where electricity runs through this tablet to connect us to the world around us at a moment notice. We have all the information at our hand. Back then, the Israelites had their tablet that was charged with the electricity of God's lightning, as he spoke, his voice thundered. And his finger wrote down the words of life for them to follow. 
You hear what I'm saying? We live in a parallel where the presence of God is readily available at all times. We do not have a lack of knowledge. We can connect with information anywhere we go. We are a millennial generation. The Bible talks about a millennial reign of a thousand years. What if we are the generation? I'm not saying this is biblical. I'm not saying the Lord said this. I just want to pose a thought. What if we are the generation that will see the reign of God? Think about being so connected through technology to believers around the world that we now all have the same tablet with the same message of salvation and of power and of love for one another and of for discipleship of the nations. So, the seven priests were carrying this box and they had their seven ram's horn trumpets, the shofars. So, first, the Lord gives the instruction, Joshua then acts out the instruction. A leader's best place is when the leader hears the instruction of heaven in worship, takes their shoes off, feels what God is doing, listens for that message, and then passes the word along to his people. Who are your people? Are they your co-workers? Are they your children? Are they your Friday night dance buddies? Dance ladies? Is it your crafting group? Is it your Bible study? Your small group? Your life group? Your connected families? Hear what I'm saying? We all have people that God has put in our life for us to be leaders to. We lead best when we serve heaven best. When we serve the Lord through worship, partnership, communication, the instruction that God gives in worship then releases you to share that instruction with others. Just like I'm doing right here now. The Lord has given me instructions about war. And it starts with worship. Now here are the instructions to you. As we read through Joshua. For six days it was completely silent. Then on the seventh day. They walked around the city. Seven times. And on the when the world is quiet. When you feel like God is silent. What are you thinking about? When Abraham walked up the mountain with his son Isaac, what was he thinking about? Was he, were, are you dwelling on God's promise when everything's quiet? Are you thinking about, hey, he showed me this, so it's, excuse me, so it's true and it's going to happen? If you are, be encouraged. Because that is going to come out of the ground. That promise is going to come out of the cloud of darkness and doubt and fear. That promise is going to come into your life. And you're going to get to have your test. The test for the Israel, the test for Abraham was, was he going to lift the knife to his son? He did, and the angel stopped him. On the other side of that, the test for the Israelites was, hey, for 40 years, God did everything for you. Now it's your turn to do something for yourself. For it says, When the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. But like anything that's given, you have to receive. I can give you a box wrapped in gold paper with shiny string. 
Now, the inside of the box could be absolutely nothing. Or the inside of the box could be full of diamonds. Or an S10 cell phone. Or, you know, the cure for cancer, right? It could be anything. It could be as amazing or as limited as your own thinking. But none of that matters if you don't rip open the paper. So God gave them the city. And then the people shouted, verse 20, when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass, and they heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted, and the walls fell down flat. So their shout pulled off the paper of the present. But then every man straight before him went into the city and took the city. They, not God, they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. So do you see that? You got to take action. Worship is wonderful time with the Lord. But we've got to pull down the shield of faith and take action. Let's go over to Hebrews where it teaches us about faith. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. If you need to pause it, pause it. For now, faith is the substance of things that are hoped for. I hope that inside of this box is an S10 cell phone. I hope that inside of this box is a puppy. The evidence isn't seen yet. It's just a box. There's nothing in there. It's just a box. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the ages were framed by the rhema of God. Worlds have been framed by the word of God. Your world, your circle of influence, your sphere of life and change has been formed and shaped by God. So that things which we see are not made of the things that appear. The periodic table of elements tells us this is how the earth is created. This is what it's made of. This is how the dinosaurs died. This is where petroleum comes from. But yet there's all these other elements the elements of faith, of love, of trust, of kindness, and of caring. And they are not scientifically, right now, quantifiably, qualified, teachable. And yet, every word of it is true. We've seen those that don't even have any interest in God, even the atheist will say, speak love. But you can't define love if you don't know the one who created it. So chapter 11 goes on to teach us on all the different things about faith and how it's set up and how it works. Protect your thoughts. Fight for what God has for you. War has a lot of regular and irregular military forces. The regular forces are you making the decision to not look that up on the internet. You making the decision that today you're going to go spend 20 minutes playing ball with your son. Today, you're going to actually make your wife dinner. I'm a family man, so I'm going to talk about my family situation a lot. But if you're single, oh, don't worry. You've got the same choices. I can choose to play that violent video game. I can choose to open my word of God. Hey, I 
can't even choose to go down the street to the food bank and pass out food to other people that need it. We have a regular military force of hard work, of integrity, of diligence, of dedication. And all of that work has value. It has much more value when we recognize through worship what it is that we're doing. Otherwise, it's just actions of behavior that are worshiping self-serving interests or pride. Because your energy is going to something that God hasn't given you to do. But then there's also, there's an angelic army. We have the things that we see of the periodic table of elements. Then we have the kingdom of heaven elements. Angels. Gold streets. Clouds of fire. Miracles of healing. Water turned into wine. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. The angel said unto Daniel, Fear not, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand, you focused your energy, your mind, and your heart to what the will of God is, to put yourself before God, to worship God, your words were heard. And I, the angel, came for your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, Persia had a king, not a prince. Why would he say prince? Remember Ephesians chapter 6? Principalities, powers of darkness. There is a spiritual war going on between light and dark. We are God's ambassadors on the earth. When I had a dream about the Ukraine and Russia and Korea, and I was chasing President Trump down, I had not a single clue about the current events that were happening at the time that happened. This was before all this stuff has unfolded. And There's always more going on than meets the eye. Um, a smartphone looks like a block of materials. And yet everything that's happening on the inside, we don't see. For those of us that have really good phones, or those that have been around really nice phones, and the ones that have the back you can't take off yourself, why is that? So you don't mess it up? Because it's that delicate and fragile on the inside. Oh, but we love using it all the time, every bit of it, trusting what's happening that we can't see. Now take that principle and apply it to your worship life. I can't feel God right now. I don't see an angel standing in the room right now. But does that change that my heart is so excited that my God hears my cry. My God sees my need in this situation and he says, Behold, my son who I am pleased in. Because I am covered by the adoption of grace, the redemption of the resurrection of the blood of my Savior, I am perceived from heaven as a son, no longer a servant, but a son who knows what the will of God is. The will of God is for us to take our war to the streets against the work of darkness, and we are to worship before every battle, just like they walked in the wilderness, excuse me, 
walked around Jericho. They followed the Ark of the Covenant with their eyes as they walked around the city. They watched it. They recognized this is the promise of God. This is God's intervention into the material world. They meditated on that. They took it to heart, the promise of God. They counted it as faith when they shouted. When they ran into the city with their sword to destroy all the wickedness of the land, of the city of Jericho, which is still right now in Israel. The ancient ruins are still there, well built, well noticeable of, wait a minute, they did that before the Romans did. Before the Trojan horse story of Greece, the Israelites did it without a Trojan horse. It was an Ark of the Covenant with angels sitting on top of a gold box. But what came out of the gold box was the power of God. By activated faith. So let me give you this parting thought. The letter of James. Chapter 2. Not John. Not Timothy. Not Hebrews. We were already there. But James. Verse 17. Even so, faith that has not works is dead and alone. Yes, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. So look forward to hearing from you. Comment, let me know what you think and feel about everything that I've spoken, send me an email, Andrew Nye, that's A-N-D-R-E-W-N-Y-E dot 86 at gmail.com. I love looking forward to your thoughts as we worship and war until the Lord returns. Get ready for how we take our worship to the advancement of the kingdom of God. Let me pray for you. Let me activate you. Father, you know the people that are watching this. You know the people that you care about and have directed them to this point in time. You know every situation they've ever been through. You know that this may have a connection that they understand or it may have a connection that they don't at this moment in time. Because it is up to you, Lord, to discern for when you're watering seeds, when you're harvesting crops, whatever stage of life they are in, I bless them to hear your voice, whether it be by a billboard on the interstate, whether it be a sign in the night, glowing, whether it's an angel visitation, whether it's the kind word of a friend, whether it's the word of God illuminated before them. I bless them to advance in their life. That their situation they're in would be affected greatly by the kingdom. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth for them. Let them have a mentality of the wealth of their own path, like the gold streets of heaven. Let them open the gate of their heart as they are a pearl of great value. Let them see with their eyes what beholds the path of the wicked. But let it not touch their life. But let them 
receive the wealth of the wicked, that they may live with life and joy and peace. By the power of the cross, the death of self, and the resurrection of life, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, by the Father's love, I pray these scenes. Amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful time. I look forward to meeting with you again soon.